Hello, everyone. There we go. My video's on. Hi, everyone. My name is Tanya Titus, and I am Modus Theater's National Outreach and Education Director and one of uh, the undocumented monologists in Modus Undocument Undocu America project. Hello, good afternoon. And I'm Rosa Sabido, one of the women whose story you will hear today, speaking to you from my place in Sanctuary, a Methodist church in Colorado that I have not left in almost three years. Today's Women of Resolution performance was planned as a live performance on stage, but instead of canceling due to the virus, MODIS is striving to offer meaningful virtual programming to people isolated by COVID-19, while at the same time helping us continue to reflect together on the ongoing challenges facing our country. This is our first virtual presentation, so we are just figuring out how to transition from the stage to the internet. One challenge is that Zoom is sometimes hacked by people inserting offensive images. This poses no threat to your computers, but we want you to note that if that actually happened, we would probably abruptly end the presentation. Today's performance, it's about sanctuary. Sanctuary is defined as a place of refuge or safety. For example, right now, because of the pandemic, people across our country are taking refuge in our homes, a kind of self-imprisonment to keep us safe and to prevent the spread of this virus to those most vulnerable. Those in sanctuary whose story you will hear today sought refuge in churches and synagogues from another threat, that of being separated from our families. We seek sanctuary not only to protect ourselves, but to speak out for 11 million undocumented immigrants living, working, and paying taxes in this country. This performance was scripted by Modus Theater's artistic director, Kirsten Wilson, based on interviews and photos that Joel Dyer did with Rosa, as well as Ingrid Encalada La Torre, Sandra Lopez, and Araceli Velasquez. Usually in Motos performances, Motos monologists read their own stories. But today our stories will be read by four women from the Colorado State Legislature. We will ask each of the legislators now to introduce themselves and read the short description of the person whose story they are reading. We'll start with Representative Leslie Herod. Hello everyone. I am Representative Leslie Herod in Denver and I'll be reading the story of Araceli Velasquez, who has lived in the United States since 2010. She is married with four children who are American citizens. She moved into sanctuary at Park Hill United Methodist Church in Temple Micah in Denver on August 18th, 2017. I'm sorry, August 8th, 2017. Greetings everyone. I am Senator Carrie Donovan and I'll be reading the story of Ingrid Insulada La Torre who has lived in the United States since she was a teenager. She is married with three children, all under the age of seven, who are American citizens. She has been in sanctuary at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Boulder in Colorado since December 16th, 2017. Hello everyone, I'm Representative Barbara McLaughlin from Durango, and I'll be reading the story of Rosa Sabido, who has called Cortez, Colorado, her home for over 32 years. She has been in sanctuary in the Mancus United Methodist Church in Colorado since June 2nd, 2017. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Representative Serena Gonzalez Gutierrez and I'll be reading the story of Sandra Lopez who originally came from Mexico in 1998. She is married with three children who are American citizens she entered sanctuary on October 19th, 2017 in the small basement of the Two Rivers Unitarian Universalist Church Parsonage in Carbondale, Colorado. 
Great, thanks to the legislators who are joining us today for modeling courageous empathy and civic hospitality. Uh, unfortunately, musician Elisa Garcia was unable to return from her grandparents' home in Uruguay because of COVID-19. So we are thrilled to have the singing of PhD candidate Teresita Lozano interwoven with the stories. And at the end, a poetic response from the legendary national slam poet, Dominique Cristina. And now we'll begin with Teresita singing on a lullaby in the Judeo-Spanish language called Ladino. The translation is, my beautiful girl, sleep sleep without anxiety and pain sleep my beautiful boy sleep sleep without anxiety and pain sleep this is a challenging time for everyone across this country so i hope that each time that isita sings you will feel she is truly singing to you personally so you can breathe, cry if you need to, and settle into your big, strong, tender hearts. This way we can all leave this performance restored for the good work ahead. Dorme, dorme. I had five days to make the decision whether to go into sanctuary. My lawyer called me up and said, if you go to your immigration check-in, you will probably be put in detention and then deported. I've lived in this country in the same little blue house next to my parents for over 32 years. And I've contributed to this country. I've worked 20 hour days, six days a week. I have my food business. I'm the secretary of the local Catholic churches. I'm the person everyone relies on to translate documents. And of course, I'm the main support for my aging parents who are citizens. I'm rooted in this community. And they were going to put me into detention, which is like being sent to jail, and then deport me? It's ridiculous. They somehow expected me to pick up and leave an entire life in just five days. Leave my home, my dogs. I love my old dogs. I love my house. The sun sets over Ute Mountain. I have stopped to watch every sunset I could over sleeping Ute Mountain for over 32 years. And they were going to deport me after all this time. I don't think it's right. So just a few days before my immigration appointment, we scheduled a conference between myself, my lawyer, and the Methodist pastor in the nearby town of Mancus. His church had just decided to be part of the sanctuary movement. He knew who I was. He had eaten my tamales. I knew his church. 
It was the beautiful little church with the garden. We were supposed to talk it through. But that morning, my stepfather was feeling very sick. He couldn't even walk. He was all bent over, and my mom was scared. I needed to get him to the emergency room. Ended up, he had kidney stones. So my first call with the pastor about sanctuary was from the ER. I remember the pastor asked me where I wanted to stay in the church. I just said, well, anywhere, you know, I could be in the kitchen. Just give me a corner. I don't mind. I just can't leave. I am not only the economic support for my parents. I'm the one who translates for them and takes care of things from their mail to their doctor's appointments. My mother has high blood pressure, problems with her thyroid, liver, enlarged heart, diabetes. And she just went to a doctor's appointment while she was visiting my brother in Mexico and they discovered she has breast cancer. And I'm stuck in this church. I can't take care of her here and I'm afraid she will die over there and I won't be with her. But if I leave sanctuary, I'm just giving up and I'm not in sanctuary just for me and my family, but for others. My position here allows me to raise awareness about what is happening to immigrants in our small communities and all across this nation. I know that sometimes our voices are heard simply by the sacrifices we make through our actions. But I miss my mom. Until last night, I truly believed I had made peace with a difficult decision to be deported to Peru, taking my two sons with me and splitting our family. I was too tired to keep fighting and face the long-term prospects of sanctuary. I was hopeful I'd find a way to start my life over again. But then the reality started to hit. Bryant, my older son in fourth grade, was crying and begging me not to force him to leave our home and his school. You see, it's not just me like it was when I first came to the US as a teenager. Now it's my two kids who are both US citizens and thinking about taking them back there away from their country. I didn't finish my degree. I don't have a profession or a way to start from zero after 20 years. And there's not really anything more than sustenance I could provide them. My aunt, who recently returned from Peru, shared with me the devastating poverty the country is facing in the aftermath of Venezuela's economic crisis. And well, it may seem like a small thing to you, but Annabelle, my two-year-old son, has a bad cold. And there's no health clinic where my family lives in Peru no place to take him if he needs a doctor. No, I decided I have to be strong and do what's best for my children. I must choose sanctuary so I can fight for my family and my community. On October 18th, 2017, after many years of being granted a stay of deportation, my lawyer called and said that my stay was denied. I was supposed to report to immigration the very next day. I remember that night was incredibly difficult for me and my husband. People who love and support me were calling, but I couldn't talk. I just needed some time alone to think about and to make sure that I wasn't making a mistake. I tried to sleep, but my eyes were wide open. I was in shock, my mind blank. 
I just didn't want the day to come. But at 6 a.m., I had to get up and wake my son Edwin for middle school. And that was the last day I got him ready from our home. I didn't want to see how upset, I didn't want him to see how upset I was. I could not tell him that what was about to happen. I had to turn my back so he didn't see me crying. I went to give him a huge hug as he headed out the door and I told him that I loved him very much. But you know, kids aren't stupid. And he said, what's wrong, mom? And I said, nothing, son, just give me a hug and I love you. And he told me he loved me. He left and I started putting things into a suitcase for me and my two-year-old daughter. After I packed, I went to inform my employer. I didn't know how to tell them. I just said, I'm not going to be able to come into work for a while. And they were confused and asked, why? What's happening? You're such a good worker. You always seem happy here. All I could say was, I have a huge emergency and I don't know how long it's going to take to resolve. I don't want to leave my job, but I don't know how long it's going to be. It really hurt going into sanctuary. I left behind not only my job, but my town, my home, my role as a parent, my role as a wife. But I did that so I would not be separated from my children. I thank God every day that I'm in sanctuary with these two faith communities, Park Hill Methodist and Temple Micah, both stand with me. I feel that I am not alone. I can fight my case from here and work to change these unjust laws. There is so much racism, so much evil that is happening. Because when you separate a mother from her child or a father, I think that is a grand evil. And you are causing deep harm to families, immigrant families. The women who are in sanctuary belong in this country. Our children belong in this country. This government should recognize the right of our children to have their mothers and fathers with them. The nightmare, the nightmare that I feel every day is that ICE comes into this sanctuary because then I would have to go back to El Salvador where death is waiting for me. And they would detain me in front of my children. And if they came for me, they would also come for all of my compadres here and across the country. And every day, this president comes out with new policies, new ideas, to exclude and deport more people. And tomorrow, he could decide that he wants everyone in sanctuary to be rounded up. That's the nightmare that I have and that I feel every day. I pray before I go to sleep. I pray when I wake up. I don't leave this room without my prayer. And I always ask God for protection and guidance and to not let me lose hope and to help me to be kind with my words and with my deeds. Whatever I say throughout the day, I ask it to be guided by the Holy Spirit and to help me with the purpose God has for me 
to help me do it right. And of course, I pray for my mom. Lord, you have come to the seashore, neither searching for the rich nor the wise, desiring only that I should follow. O Lord, with your eyes set upon me, gently smiling, you have spoken my name. All I longed for, I have found by the water at your side. Seek other shores. Who sobs me and look at things? In mi barca no hay oro ni espadas, tan solo redes y mi trabajo. Señor, me has mirado a los ojos, sonriendo, has dicho mi nombre, y en la I first came to the United States with my husband 21 years ago. We were young and had so many dreams. We were trying to escape poverty, violence, and a very corrupt government. We wanted to live somewhere we could buy a house someday and have a safe home for our children. It took us two days to cross the desert. We had no water. We had no food. I'll never forget the cacti. They would just rip up your shoes every step. And some people didn't even have shoes. But we eventually made it to Colorado near my husband's cousins. My husband got a job in construction and I found work cleaning houses and hotels. We had our first boy, Alex, who is now 19, and then Edwin, who is 14. And I have my daughter, Areli, who is two. We are honest, hardworking people with dreams of getting ahead. And now our American children have their own dreams. I was helping my son, Alex, go to college to become a mechanic. But unfortunately, being a migrant in this country holds a very high price. And now that I'm in sanctuary, I can no longer help my son pay for his tuition and he had to drop out. And my younger son, Edwin, is so smart, but now he's afraid. He can't focus at school. He doesn't eat well. He stays awake throughout the night worrying about what will happen. But Colorado is our life. My husband will never go back. Not now. Three months ago, his cousin, who is a US resident, 
went back to Mexico for vacation with his wife. He was buying a tractor for his family and they were both murdered by a group of criminals while they were working by the tractor. Why did they kill them? They didn't have any reason. And his family has kids. My husband said, no, I don't want to go to Mexico. I've lived in Colorado most of my life. I came here from Peru when I was 17 years old to live with my aunt. I was very poor in my country. I came for the American dream, a better life, the chance for an education. But I felt I had to buy a social security number to get to work. I didn't want to depend on my aunt or on the government, anyone else. I was young and healthy and I had hands and feet to go and support myself. And then later my son, I wanted to study. I did pay for some semesters of college, but it's so expensive when you don't have a social security number having to pay out of state tuition and out of pocket. But now when some people hear my story, they say I'm a thief because I stole a social security number. And yes, I did purchase that number on the street so I could get a job washing dishes at the nursing home. But I didn't know it belonged to someone. I thought it was fake. And yet I paid for that mistake with jail time, with fees. Over $11,000 to the court system and money to the IRS. And I was in jail for months and separated from my two-year-old son. I did probation and I spent thousands and thousands of dollars on immigration lawyers. I more than paid for that impact and my son paid for it too. But now I'm facing this double jeopardy because I'm also expected to pay for that mistake I was born in El Salvador. To honor her words, I'm going to start over just a little bit because I don't know where I stopped having Ingrid's story. Sorry, Representative Herod, why don't you go ahead? I had some technical difficulties. I was born in El Salvador. I made the difficult decision to come to the United States in 2010 when I was 19. I never imagined I would come to the US. I am the youngest of all of my siblings. So I thought my role would be to stay and care for my parents always. But the violence in my country became unbearable. I thought crossing the US border was the only way I could save my life. The journey was terrible. I was afraid and so hungry. I went the whole week without eating any food, just water. I was trying to make it across two countries 
that I'd never been in and I knew nothing about. I didn't know if my life was going to end entering the US or if I was going to be able to survive the journey and continue on. There were many difficult and challenging things that happened. But I feel really grateful to God because there were people all along the way who helped me. And because there were more good people crossing my path than harmful people, I made it to the US border. There was one young man I'll never forget. I was in a bad situation. The only woman in a group of men preparing to cross the border. We were in the middle of nowhere. In some old abandoned barn. A few men wanted to abuse me. There was a young man who stepped in pretending he was my boyfriend and he protected me. I've always felt that he was like God personified in that moment because he had no reason to help me. We didn't know each other, but he stood up for me and protected me. When we crossed the border, we were caught and separated. But I felt in that moment that God was saying to me, you are going to be safe now. I've protected you in this moment and it's going to be okay. I've never been able to find him again. And I've tried so many ways all over social media, but I've found no trace of him. I would so love to be able to thank him and tell him what that meant to me. After all I had been through, to have this stranger, this man I didn't know, stand up and protect me. If I let myself get deported and sent back to Mexico, I could be with my mom as she continues her cancer treatment. But if I do, I'll soon be the one needing help. You see, it's been so long since I left Mexico that I won't know how to survive. In Mexico, there's an age. And once you pass that age, you're not hired for any job, good or bad. I'm not a young person. How could I start over? It's not like I left yesterday or two years ago. It has been 32 years, and I don't think of it as home. I just wish I had the freedom to go back and forth. That's what I'm looking for, that freedom. A lot of people have that freedom. Why was it not created for me? Why not for me? It used to be that way years ago. We could work hard, earn what we got, and then go back home to Mexico. It was really simple. They made it complicated. Why? My two nephews, Daniel and Alejandro grew up in Colorado. They graduated from our local high school. They both got deported, which is hard because Daniel has a son who was born in the US and Daniel hasn't seen his own son in 10 years. And even after 10 years of living in Mexico, it's very hard for Daniel and Alejandro because they grew up in America. They're American. Now Daniel works in Mexico for Nordstrom Customer Service. So that's very convenient because they don't want us here 
where they would have to pay us 15 to $20 an hour. But then they have these offices in other countries. And in Mexico, he doesn't get paid more than $100 a week working 12 hour days doing the same thing that others do here. Are we really taking someone else's jobs? I fell into deportation because of Colorado law, Senate Bill 90. The show me your papers law that requires law enforcement to report anyone they thought might be undocumented to immigration. You see, in 2010, my husband and I had an argument that any couple might have. Our children were listening in the bedroom and one of the kids called 911 and hung up. Parents fighting can be scary for kids. And in school, he was taught to call 911 if he needed help. So he was just doing what he had been taught. My husband and I had already finished our argument when the police showed up at the house. The officer started asking my husband questions about why 911 was called. The officer started asking, the officer was getting frustrated because my husband was refusing to answer any questions. I told the officer that we had a simple argument that we resolved ourselves. But the police officer said, no, this must be domestic violence. Then seeing that I wasn't to accuse my husband of violence and my husband wasn't accusing me, the officer asked for a Colorado ID. And of course, I didn't have one. And that's when his behavior changed towards me. He started yelling at me and said he was arresting me. My husband kept pleading, no, arrest me. Don't take my wife, take me instead. But the officer took me out of my home in handcuffs. And by midnight at the jail, I had received a call from ICE. My husband was furious that they could arrest me under false charges and tried to get me out of jail. He eventually was able to meet with the district attorney and explain the situation. The DA agreed there was no justification for charging me with domestic violence. And he told my husband they were dropping the charges and that my record would be clean. So after two weeks in jail, I went to court and the judge officially dropped the charges. He said, you were wrongfully arrested and I'm really sorry this happened. But unfortunately, you're now in the hands of immigration. I wish you luck. That's all that he said. He wished me luck. I remember back in 2016, after Trump won the election, my son Bryant was then seven and he was crying and crying because he thought now everyone's parents were going to be deported. He was inconsolable because during the whole election cycle from when Trump first launched his campaign, there was so much racist rhetoric against immigrants and our kids really And our kids really absorbed the way he was talking about immigrants. For any kid who has immigrant parents, even if that kid is themselves a citizen, 
They still felt rejection with the election of Trump, like their country was rejecting them. All I kept thinking as I crossed Guatemala and Mexico was that if I could just make it to the United States, I would finally be safe. I would find help. But I got caught crossing the border. And when immigration caught me, I thought, this is not the country that El Salvadorians think it is. Because when immigration catches you, they treat you like a criminal, like a wild animal, like someone who has killed someone, or maybe worse. They put you in handcuffs and then chain them to your waist or your feet, like you're someone who is very dangerous. When immigration found us, I tried to run and the agent tackled me to the ground with a ton of force. They don't treat you with any kind of respect or care. And so in that moment, I realized this was not the country I thought it was. They took me to what migrants call the freezer. And it was so cold. During the three days I was there, I didn't have a blanket. Once, they brought us a sandwich. But it was frozen, a frozen sandwich that cracked and you couldn't eat. They put me and about 12 other people in a room and the bathroom was right in the room with us. You had to use the bathroom where everyone else could see you. There weren't any mattresses or places to lie down. There were just concrete benches and that's where we slept. This was in McAllen, Texas. Then every couple of hours, immigrant agents would come and would take you out of the freezer to interrogate you. They just repeatedly did that, trying to get you to talk. They moved us several times to different jails or detention centers to do the same thing. They would just put us on a bus. We didn't know where we were going and then they would move us again. Eventually, I arrived at a detention center close to Houston where I started to feel some hope because it was more residential. I didn't feel so much like a jail and they treated us with more respect. That's where they told me I would be released pending my asylum case. My brothers were in New York living with a group of other men, but because of all of my bad experiences, I didn't want to live with men I didn't know. And I decided I would come to Colorado where my female cousins lived. It was still so hard that first year. But when I met my husband, everything changed. We met through family and friends at a dinner party. It was difficult at first because of all the things I had been through. I was afraid to be in a relationship, to be close with someone again. But I took the risk and I feel 
it's the best risk I've ever taken in my life. I never thought I would get married or that I would have three children. And I never thought I would meet someone who was so understanding, so patient, someone who would fight next to me every day and always be there for me. I never thought I would meet someone like that. So I felt really grateful to God that I met him and that we built this life we have together. For me, he is like an angel and God put him in my path right at that moment, right when I needed him most. Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto, me dio dos luceros que cuando los abro, perfecto distingo lo negro del blanco y en el alto cielo su fondo estrellado y en las multitudes. El hombre que yo amo, gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto, me ha dado la marcha de mis pies cansados, con ellos anduve ciudades y charcos, playas y desiertos, montañas y llanos, y a la casa tuya, tu calle y tu patio. Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto, me ha dado la risa y me ha dado el llanto, así yo distingo Dicha de quebranto, los dos materiales que forman mi canto. Y el canto de ustedes es mi mismo canto. Y el canto de todos, que es mi propio canto. Gracias a la vida. Gracias a la vida. My husband, Eliseo, was born in Mexico and came to the United States as a teenager without documentation. His father is a United States citizen and his mother is a permanent resident. He has no arrest order, but I found out about him while investigating me here in Sanctuary, and they went after him. I fear they are going after him just to put more pressure on me. It's cruel. He was just going to the store to get groceries. They had no warrant. They just followed him into Safeway. How am I going to tell my children that their father is not coming? It is wrong to take their father. He is the one who supports us. It is wrong to take away a good father. My mother was able to apply for me to be a US resident over 19 years ago. And then in 2006, the application was approved. But people don't understand. That doesn't give me any legal status. It just gives me the opportunity to apply for permanent residency when my number comes up. But the system is so backlogged 
that it's going to take another 15 to 20 years until my turn comes. And if my mother dies, my application cancels automatically. After I was released from jail for domestic violence, I had to hire a lawyer to deal with immigration. Unfortunately, I hired a very bad lawyer. And despite the false charges, he lost my case. I'll never forget. I got the call from his secretary saying, we lost your case and you have to leave the country in two days. I said, what are you talking about? Why didn't you tell me sooner? You think I can prepare everything, leave the country and my children in two days? What have you been doing all this time? She said, sorry, your file was misplaced. With just two days to appeal, I had no time to find a better lawyer, but of course, as a result of this lawyer's negligence, the appeal was denied and I ended up with orders of deportation. When I found out, I hired a new lawyer to better represent me. And she has been able to keep me in the country with a stay of removal filed each year. So every year I must report to ICE they take my fingerprints and verify I haven't done anything bad. How many more moons and suns, days and nights, winds and rains and wasted tears, unused minutes, eternal hours, when the future will become present? when a smile will come from genuine happiness, when I will be able to make a plan for tomorrow, for next year, or for the rest of my life. After about six months in the United States, my siblings were able to come up with some money for me to get a lawyer who would take my case through asylum proceedings. The first time we went for a consultation, the lawyer received some of the, of the papers in my case, but he never asked me what had happened in my country of origin. He never prepared me for court or told me what, it was, going, what was going to happen. The office just called and told me, you have court on this date at this time and try to be there a little beforehand. That was all the conversation we had about court. And then during the final hearing, the judge asked me what had happened to me in El Salvador. But I never had any psychological treatment leading up to court or ever in my life. And to be honest with you, I couldn't even tell you what I said that day. My nerves and my emotions took over and I couldn't think. All I wanted was for them to stop asking me those questions so I can get out of there. For me, talking about it is reliving it. And I just wanted it to stop. And well, the asylum was denied. So the lawyer asked for a stay of deportation. Every time they filed this stay, it was 7,000 dollars and it only lasted a year. I remember the third time 
We had just sold our car a few days earlier. We had other plans for what we were going to do with that money for our family. When the lawyer said, we need the money again for another stay. So we gave them $7,000 and that $7,000 lasted them just two weeks, two weeks of legal work. At the end of the two weeks, they called us and said, we need more money because your account is at zero. We just felt so much rage and frustration and impotence. Like, what happened to all that money? What did they do with all that money? The lawyer told me at my next check-in in 2017 that I had to leave. I told him, I can't go back to my country. I can't go back. He said, I'm sorry. Angry. This is your fault, I said. You think just because I don't speak English that I don't know what was happening? I was there in court when they were asking the lawyer about my case and everyone knew the lawyer didn't know the answers. And he said, well, if you don't think that we did a good job, then I don't want to take your case. And he literally threw the papers with my case at me. And then he said, go, go. I don't want your case. I don't want anything more from you. Despair shook my body and I just started laughing. And I said, what case? What case are you going to take? You lost my case. There is no case. I spent thousands of dollars on lawyers to represent me, but they really didn't put much attention into my case. And that's really messed up my situation to the point that I have to be in sanctuary. I could have gotten a lesser sentence for using a false social security number. I could have pled not guilty because I didn't know it was someone else's number. But when they took me to jail, Bryant was just two years old and without me, he was not eating. My aunt brought Bryant to see me in the jail, trying to help him, but they would not let me hold him. He could just look at me from behind the glass and he kept screaming and crying for me. He didn't understand that I couldn't remove the glass and hold him. My aunt said that it took him two days to calm down. He just kept crying and crying, and they did not have the compassion to let me touch my baby. The lawyer told me that if I pled guilty, I would get out with probation, pay the IRS, and I would be with my son again. He assured me it would not cause problems with immigration. But if I tried to fight my case, I might end up back in jail. So I pled guilty and returned to my family. But the lawyer did not understand immigration law and pleading guilty has ruined my life. I found out 
that the woman whose social security number I used got in a lot of trouble because I used her number. She was on benefits and the government took them away and accused her of working at the nursing home. It was very hard on her family. They needed their benefits. She suffered a lot and I feel terrible about it. I tried to reach out and apologize and see if there is something I could do to help pay her. But she will not talk to me. I was not trying to hurt her. I didn't know by working at the nursing home I was hurting anyone. I would like her to forgive me. I don't want to be taken from my children. I have not been able to get out of the false charge against me, although I have fought deportation for eight years. And now I have become a leader. This immigration system that is so unjust is what forces us to become leaders. You aren't born a leader, you become a leader. Myself, along with other mothers who had been detained under Colorado's Senate Bill 90, we got together and we went to the Capitol in Denver. We told our stories. We told them the truth of what the police were doing with us. All of us were in the deportation system because of something insignificant, like not doing a complete stop or having a tail, tail light go out or being wrongly accused. And one of the senators, after listening, used my story on the Senate floor to explain the danger of this law. Because of our advocacy, Senate Bill 90 was repealed and now everyone is safer from this type of racial profiling. The night is my muse, because that's when I'm all by myself here in the church. And I go outside in the quiet and sit. Sometimes I write a poem. Other times I just sit and pray or reflect. This is when my old life returns to me, and I think of my pets. When I would come home from work and my dogs would jump all over me, and I would hug them and kiss them. Those moments for my sweet life. And on one of these nights, the church was surrounded in floodlights. I pulled the blinds and there were five different patrols out there. The state, sheriff, a couple of Mancus police cars, and one more that I don't remember. They had their lights all facing the church. I was like, oh my God, they are going to take me to some detention center in the middle of the night while no one is looking. The attendant from the congregation who stays with me went and got his phone because they are instructed to record the incident for the ACLU if something happens. He started to go outside, already beginning to record their attempt to take me. When the police officer tells him, go back inside, there's an angry bear. It was the bear they were after. They had been chasing it through town and out of every single street. The bear had come here to this church. You see that old brown bear and I? We're so dangerous. We're such a harm that we need all of these police to come after us. The bear and I are now buddies because we are so bad. We are a gang. They now say in Mancus that there truly is sanctuary for, for all at the Methodist church because the bear came here. Undocumented people come to this country for a better future. If there was a path to legalization, 
we would not be in this situation. And I would like for Congress to act because we are not talking about 10 undocumented people or 1,000. We are 11 million living and working, paying taxes and contributing to this country. Our children are citizens of this country. They go to school with your children, play soccer with your children, go to church with your children. They should not lose their parents, but be supported to do the best for their country. So I can't tell you how my heart hurts whenever I hear of immigration rates at American companies, because that means they are separating many families. Children are just left waiting at the school parking lot for parents who never arrive. It is so unfair. They lose their parents just because they don't have documents. Or those children who arrive at the border and are being put into cages. Those of you who think separating children can be justified, imagine your child in a cage. And now we are seeing cases of children who are dying or being sexually abused in these detention centers. They are suffering a lot. It is inhumane what the system is doing. And it is just going to create problems because then these children have psychological damage from the separation. That's how people grow up violent because of the system that is destroying lives. There should be more education in the schools about how this country is made of immigrants so people respect us and people need to touch their hearts Remember the children and make changes. For years, I've been granted a stay of deportation. I have had a legal work permit, a social security number, a driver's license, but now they can just deport me from my community. So what is the game in this system? What is the game? There is no reason. This is a political decision to please that racist base of the party. I work cleaning houses and hotels and I've had to pay more than $38,000 in legal fees. Fees to the government. All my work goes into paying for other people. I always say the government doesn't want immigration reform because immigrants were a huge business for them and for all the private detention facilities. People say there are no more slaves in this world, but that's not true. Slavery continues in other forms and we are part of this new slavery. That's the truth. And people need to know the truth about systems of economic exploitation and what they're doing with us. That's why I'm not going with ICE and participating in this unjust system. I may not have a legal paper, but I don't need a legal paper to stay with my kids. I'm a mother, I don't need that.
It has been my dream to own a well-established food business. I wanted to be the best, not a big chef on TV, but simply to make good food. That's what I love. My favorite moment is when you take the first bite and taste my food and you tell me what it's like. That's my happiest moment. I love that. Living in this country, I have noticed that there's a lot of terrible food. I was so upset by this. These people need to know how to eat. That was my thing. You haven't eaten real Mexican burritos. You have to taste my burritos so you know. Or you have to taste my tamales so you know. But even though back in 2000, I bought a food truck, my situation was never really stable. My parents and I were trying to get my citizenship. I was always needing to pay immigration lawyers, fees, money, money, money. And all of the expenses really prevented me from starting my business. I had to keep working two other jobs while trying to sell my tamales. I paid $30,000 for a food truck. It is parked by my house. It was all part of my dreams. But if you see that truck and you see my old house and you see how those things look right now, it's like how things have turned out. It's getting old with the dream inside. And now it is happening to me. I'm getting old with the dream inside. I know I have a legal case because if I don't get asylum, I will be kidnapped or killed. It would be as though this government is taking my life away and leaving my kids as orphans. My only relief has been in thinking that somehow I would find a way to leave the kids with their father. I don't know how it would happen because Jorge couldn't stay home with three small boys. He has to work to take care of them, but then they would be alive and I wouldn't lose them to a gang. And even though there is no life for me without them, it would comfort me to imagine them safe with Jorge. But even that comfort is being denied me. For soon, my immigration, for soon, immigration will come after Jorge too. He has had temporary protected status from President Bush for over 22 years. But the Trump administration is taking that status away. So soon, both of us will be targeted. And my heart is breaking. I must be strong and prepare myself to stay in sanctuary as long as it takes, as long as it takes. I always tell people that God doesn't work like a genie in a bottle. To really understand how God works, it takes a lifetime. It takes trials and tests and good times and bad times. And when you look back, you think, oh, no wonder God prepared us. But we don't know how to read or listen to the message. We just keep wondering and we just keep asking. 
Why me, Lord? But God has his reasons, his way. I have experienced that myself. And I truly know that the things that I have lived through since I was little to this point are because God was trying to get me strong enough to be here at this moment. I have been in sanctuary over a year. My mother, Blanca Valdivia, died on July 23rd, 2018 in Mexico without me. And I am paying a very high price of sorrow and grief and nothing will take that away from me. Adios, Mariquita linda. Ya me voy porque tú ya no me quieres como yo te quiero a ti. Adios, Chaparrita Chula. Me voy para tierras muy lejanas y ya nunca volveré. Adios, vida de mi vida. La causa de mi dolor. I'm here in sanctuary showing my face. I'm not running. I'm not hiding. I'm fighting for my family and all the immigrant families facing separation. They think that there are laws only for poor people like me, but I have my dignity and I lift up my voice and say, here I am. I am honest, hardworking immigrant, and I'm raising my voice for those 11 million immigrants who have also come here to work, who have come here with dreams of getting ahead. And we have never lost that dignity of defending our human rights because we love our children and we love being free. What is that beautiful story behind the Statue of Liberty worth? The whole sanctuary movement. We are appealing to that history. What liberty? Where am I? I'm in sanctuary awaiting deportation after having paid thousands and thousands of dollars working for others like a slave. Is that liberty? No. Let us come together as a community to protect each other and insist on humanitarian application of immigration laws. It is difficult enough to maintain strong families why would our government 
separate us when we are working to provide a good home and life for our children? Why are we being hunted for not having a document? I don't understand it. Human dignity is not based on one legal paper. We aren't creatures from a different world. I am simply a woman and like any other mother whose children are threatened, I have lost the fear of lifting up my voice. Do you understand? I'm a human being. I have feelings just like you. I love my children just like you. Just like you. At this time when everything waits, when the emptiness is a big load, when everything hurts, when my heart is about to explode and I feel like I'm about to sink, the hand of God comes and holds me tightly. I think it's time for us to act and live without fear. We need to be in the streets doing strikes, hunger strikes and labor strikes and lifting up our voices. I don't think that hiding will save us. We have to speak out and change, not only these policies, but also this administration. We have to see this president go. He's someone who is just not ethical. I've been trying to say to people that it's never too late to get involved with one with not one more deportation or another organization. Make your voice heard. Be part of the change. A dream I always had as a little girl was to get married in a church and to be in all white and for my father to give me away. Because all of my siblings have partners and families, but they didn't have the money to get married formally in a church. I thought as the last child, I could make this happen and my father would feel very proud. I was raised Catholic, but over these past 10 months, in sanctuary, I have decided that someday Jorge and I will get married in this church because this church accepts you for who you are, whether you're white or black or straight or gay, this church accepts you and everything that you bring. It is a place where if you give them $20, they are going to invest that $20 in the people who need it. This church in Temple Micah hosts 25 women who are homeless every other month. My children and I help prepare their beds and their meals. I see the women who run this program and they do it from a place of such grand love. It doesn't matter to them if the woman who walks through the door is dirty or clean, if she's making sense or not. They treat all of the women in the homeless program 
like they are queens. I want to belong to something like that, where I'm a part of something that gives back and recognizes people for who they are. Someday, Jorge and I will be married in this church and I will wear all white, but my father won't be here to give me away. Es un buen tipo, mi viejo, que anda solo y esperando. Tiene la tristeza larga de tanto venir andando. Y yo lo miro desde lejos, pero somos tan distintos. Es que creció con el siglo, con tranvía y vino tinto. Viejo, mi querido viejo, y ahora ya caminas lento, como perdonando al viento. Yo soy tu sangre, mi viejo, soy tu silencio y tu tiempo. Él tiene los ojos buenos y una figura pesada. La edad se le vino encima. Sin carnaval ni comparsa, yo tengo los años nuevos, mi padre los años viejos. El dolor lo lleva dentro y tiene historia sin tiempo. Viejo, mi querido viejo, y ahora ya caminas lento, como perdonando el viento. Yo soy tu sangre, mi viejo, soy tu silencio y tu tiempo. For the people in Colorado, I am doing something important because now they can learn what is going on. It is easy to blame and blame a person, but the whole system is the problem. We are decent people, normal people. We are your neighbors, your family, your employees, and sometimes even your employers who are simply here to live, be productive, and have something to offer to the community. I'd like to invite you to get to know each of us in sanctuary through our stories and commit to take action. We, the people, have the power to make things change. We, the people are a force that can transform the improbable to the possible. I was asked in an interview a few months ago what it would be like to have migrant justice. It's almost hard to imagine. It seems so far away. But I think that a lot of it would be just feeling free to move, to move about without always looking over your shoulder, to have that freedom to go to the store and to the park with your children. The happiness of walking my boys to school every day, knowing they can always hold my hand. 
to be able to help my son Alex pay for his studies at the university and that Edwin is no longer anxious and can sleep through the night. To finally have the freedom to plan my life and decide my own future. And to simply not be afraid. Durme, durme, hermoso doncella. Durme, durme, silencio sin dolor. Durme, durme, sin sin dolor durme durme hermoso y rico durme durme sin ansia sin we can take a few shared breaths together as we feel the impact of Teresita's beautiful voice and these stories of women in sanctuary. Before Dominique Cristina offers a poetic response, I would like to ask the legislators to speak briefly about the impact of reading these stories. And maybe we can start with Representative Herod. Yeah, hi. Um, well, you know, this is the second time I've performed uh, this story and each time it hits me a little differently. Um, I think being here in isolation with so many other people right now, the rest of the, the country, um, it feels heavier and I think I, uh, maybe even have more of a sense of what it could be like to have to stay in sanctuary for so long um, and how hard that is. Um, it's an honor to be able to hold these stories and to be able to share them uh, with everyone today. Uh, I want to thank the women who are in sanctuary um, for, for sharing their stories and for fighting, not only for themselves, but others. Um, and I'm proud to help um, lead some of the work with my colleagues, uh, some who are here today, um, and even let you know that we did recently pass a law um, to ban a courthouse arrest for a civil arrest for those who are undocumented, who are just seeking justice. Um, it's so important that people have access to our courts um, when they are you know, victims or when they are facing, um, you know, landlords or wage theft or anything that's just unjust. And so we want to make sure that folks can show up to our courthouses and not fear arrest. And I'm proud to say that just last week, the governor signed our bill um, and that is now law. I wouldn't be working on these stories though if it wasn't for these women who lift, lifted them up for these bills, if it wasn't for these women who have lifted up their stories, but also to my family who lives in Southern Colorado, I think my mom and dad might be listening, um, and my, I think my Aunt Judy might be on too, and my, my sisters Monica and Madonna. Um, I want to thank them for uh, really you know, helping me to see uh, how folks might feel 
and how courageous it is just to, to come to this country and to seek a better life for your children, which I think everyone wants, um, but some people are denied that or have to face deportation or being told that they're criminals uh, just for seeking a better life. So thank you all for, for being brave. Thank you for sharing your story. And I'm, I'm proud to be here to lift that up today. Maybe we can jump to Representative McLaughlin. Thank you. I agree so much with what uh, Representative Herod was saying. Um, we're isolated right now. I'm away from my family and um, I know that I will be getting to see them again. Um, and people in sanctuary don't always know that and that makes a huge difference. I'd read through this script, but when you hear the different voices of the different characters that, you know, the legislators, it just really brought it to life. And uh, I confess to crying often during this today, even though I'd read the words, to hear the words was very different. Um, the treatment Rosa and her family and all these other families have received makes me very angry. And the loss of her mother makes me very, very sad because um, we should all be able to say goodbye to our parents and um, to do so with love and grace. Um, these stories make me think of my own privilege that I have, and um, I also commit to taking action. Representative Gonzalez Gutierrez. Thank you. I want to start off by saying no human is illegal. And um, I think that the women that have shared these stories are incredibly brave. Uh, and I very much appreciate them using that, that bravery, that courage to, um, to bring these stories to light. Uh, because as we heard from my colleagues, it, you know, if no one hears these stories, um, then we can't compel people to work on these kinds of issues. I'm a mother myself of three young children. And so seeing the, um, the photos of Ingrid and Sandra um, with their children, you know, that brought tears to my eyes. And, and even in some of the stories around having to leave your children or even having your young children to come with you, um, I can't imagine uh, what, that would, what that would feel like. And I'm always talking to my children of, you know, the, how fortunate that they are. Um, you know, when we started hearing the stories of children in cages, I made sure that my kids knew about that and that they, they, they understood the issues that um, other children are facing um, to teach them to also be advocates and to be compassionate. And uh, as you heard uh, Representative Herod talk about policies that we work on, that is why I have always, um, you know, in my short time in the legislature have continued to work on policies that impact our immigrant community, um, you know, things just as simple. And, and, you know, when I speak with people in this um, work, it is not a simple thing. Things um, involving, um, you know, U visas, uh, for instance, for victims of crimes that are, are seeking, um, seeking that protection. And um, it goes along with the same, um, the same issue around people feeling safe to come forward um, if they've been a victim of a crime. And so I, I continue to work on these issues and I always support my colleagues that, that work on these issues as well. And um, thank you. Senator Donovan. Hello, me. Um, I hope I can stick with you guys for a little bit. My internet connection stays stable enough. Uh, to be able to uh, share with you, first of all, my um, gratitude for letting me be a part of this 
a uh, special moment. Um, and to the MODIS staff for their incredible flexibility in responding to unprecedented times, although I would expect nothing less from a theater crew. <laughs> um, uh, and also just um, gratitude for these four women for not only just sharing their stories, but also being vulnerable enough to uh, share them over and over again and to let strangers like myself uh, have the privilege to uh, put their words out there for the public. That, that's a, a level of bravery um, that I think as a public official who often finds myself in front of a mic talking about things that I never anticipated speaking in public about, um, I have a real appreciation for. I, I also am being very reflective about the real uh, return of racism in our country and how that has been such a disturbing and uh, hurtful uh, thing that I think that um, some of our leaders in DC are empowering by their constant rhetoric around racism and providing a platform and empowering that type of uh, language and behavior uh, to be not only just um, hidden in the dark recesses of our society, but out front in social media and in the news and behavior and in policy writing. It is, it is shocking. And you see the impact of that when uh, Ingrid is willing to not only share her story, but talk about how it impacts her young kids. I mean, think about how vulnerable you are as a kid and how those, um, as an educator, I see that one experience can impact a child for their lifetime. And these are the interactions that they are hearing. This is how they are hearing their country treat them and their parents. Um, it's horrific. But I think what is important today is the bravery of sharing these stories gives humanity. And what racism attempts to do is to get rid of the human, to get rid of the personal, and, and to use rhetoric to make broad strokes and, and, and to hide the human in unacceptable language and behavior. And these stories just won't let that happen. So if we can keep reminding people um, that maybe not see these days, days, tell Ingrid's story, tell other stories, uh, we can start to combat uh, the rhetoric of racism that some of our elected leaders are using right now. So uh, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this today. And thank you to Ingrid for sharing her story. Thank you all. We are thrilled to have our sanctuary leaders with us whose stories were read. Um, so I'm going to ask Rosa Sabido, can you speak briefly about what it was like to have part of your experience read aloud? Very touching, very like I, every time I, I, I hear or see my story, you know, I read it, it's, it's, I leave the story again. And then I realize that I'm inside the story. It's present, it's still there. And it's um, something that I'm not sure when it's gonna be over. Um, I, I want to thank the representatives or uh, legislators here for uh, their uh, beautiful work of reading the stories and, and getting involved, emotionally involved, understanding and, and um, uh, put themselves in our shoes uh, for a moment, you know, for, um, so they can truly understand the struggle and, and the difficulties that we're facing every day, even though some days are, they're looking the same and some days are just, um they just go by the uh, long and 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 without changes but but uh for us it's part of the fight and the resistance and um so i i want to thank moto theater to you know for this for this presentation and for bringing 
the stories to more and more people. And now uh, with this opportunity through this um, online and, um, presentation and also just to uh, maybe to feel uh, more connection between us and now the people all over the world who are living in their own sanctuary, you know, uh, and taking shelter in place and 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 um, just uh, being protected for a threat from a threat. That's what we are. That's where that's where our reality is every day every day so i want to thank you all and i'm i'm really grateful and thanks for the invitation thank you rosa and ingrid encalada la torre is represented by katie larson today hi all um i am the organizer that works for ingrid and as you heard in her story she has three children so i get to be here while she is taking care of them um for for Ingrid when I have spoken to her about hearing her story told to her in this way um she always shares with me that it is it, it really is more not that it's more impactful but it hits your heart in a different way when somebody is presenting your own story to you um and I can resonate with that I always was like what does she mean and then listening today to her story be read this is the first time that I have not also been translating her story as she's telling it um and it really is just like you know parts that have come become normal to me and things that you are just like oh these are experiences she has lived um once you are not the one presenting it anymore really impact you in a different way and and they're felt much deeper on on her and myself as well. Thank you. And Sandra Lopez and Araceli Velasquez could not join us today, but Modus and Documanologist Laura Peniche will be sharing a few of their words. Hi, everyone. I had the pleasure of working with um, the women while we were writing these stories. Um, Paul Kirsten was uh, putting together this beautiful script. We were consulting with the women and both Sandra and Araceli are sorry they can't be here. Araceli is dealing with the sick baby at home and um, Sandra is going through a really uh, tough immigration um, proceeding legal case that is, uh, you know, she's being advised not to do any public speaking right now, but she is happy that we are sharing this story because she believes that there's been a little bit of a, a drop in the momentum of the sanctuary movement and what is happening with families who are still in sanctuary and who have been there for years now and how we on the outside we keep going on on our lives and we can you know be thinking about what's the next thing uh, what's happening politically and focus on that but it's you know these families are still there and so i know that they are grateful that we are sharing the story and i personally i am so grateful too because these stories help me get inspired as as a person who grew up in this country and documented for over 20 years uh, to see a movement of people um, such as the sanctuary movement come together and help families who are facing great injustice. Um, it's very beautiful, uh, but it gives me hope and it gives me strength. So I hope that these stories are also giving hope and strength to all the immigrant families out there in this country suffering right now. Thank you. We now have the pleasure of hearing a poetic response by National Slam Poet Champion, Dominique Christina. Okay. How do you say, 
American dream in Nahuatl. You say wounded knee. How do you say American dream in Japanese? You say Nagasaki. You say Hiroshima. How do you say American dream in Zulu? You say Middle Passage. You say transatlantic slave trade. How do you say American dream in Spanish? You say border wall. You say detention. You say the mud in my mouth is the only tongue I know. You say, I am all that is left of my people. You say, I do not know where my people are. You say mass grave when they say Columbus. You say tyranny when they say founding fathers. You say, this hurt is a languageless land. You say home is where the bodies are buried. You say, Railroad tracks and shanty towns, you say ghetto and segregation, you say barrio and tenement, you say poverty and mass grave, you say this is the story of my birth, you say English is a parasite I marry every morning. You say my prayers don't seem to work here, you say we pledge allegiance to the legacy of men who are celebrated for how they genocide. You say switchblade, you say machete, you say bullhorn, you say brass knuckles, you say, I survived the coyotes to get here. You say, my son just wants to go to college. You say, I almost died on the journey. Don't you recognize me? I'm the sister you didn't know to look for. The one with stars in her eyes. The one with scars on her hands. The one who ran the desert in bare feet. The one who crouched in the dark looking for a North Star, a breadcrumb trail, a compass, a roadmap. The one who sits now on a church pew waiting for God to show you say, America, I heard the promise of you and I stretched out my hand. You say, America, be the tourniquet. What is a border but a keep out sign? What does it mean to be illegal? Any law that says I don't deserve respect is a lie I know how to fight. Any law that says kids deserve to be put in cages is a lie. I know how to fight. Why do you require space between us? Why is my homeland the reason you can't know me? What music has been lost in detention centers, border patrols, and campaigns of terror? How can we find each other in the dark? What is it about politics that compromises humanity? Undocumented means undeserving? You need paperwork to know I'm human. I'm a concert of bruises, the hidden one, the unwanted one, the sequestered one, the unnamed one, the misnamed one, the hungry one, the captured one, the orphaned one, prodigal sister, swallowing the moon, the raw material of possible. Can you see me? Despite the battering ram of deportation forces and crowds chanting, build a wall, can you see me? incalculable, immeasurable, holy. Can you see me beyond the noise and danger? Holy. Above famine and forcible removal? Holy. Above confusion and terror? Holy. Above sound and fury? Holy. Above growl and snare? Holy. We are, each of us, capable of at least one miracle. I've risked the air in my lungs, 
distilled every honeyed cell to starshine, to look a threat in the eye, to move knowingly with purpose toward a home I can believe in, one I can curate for my children. Can you see me pinned behind a wall, tethered to my will, me, and the super terrestrial drumbeat of my impossible Colosseum heart, immovable, impossible, resolute. Adelante. Amen. Thank you so much. And now some raised hands for the powerful <laughs> reflections of the legendary Dominic Christina in this virtual world. <laughs> Thank you. On behalf of Modus Theater, we want to again say thank you to all of the courageous women in sanctuary whose stories we have heard today, the legislators who stood in their shoes, Modus's powerful contributing artists, including photojournalist Joel Dyer, and Kara Chavez, Modus's community development and marketing coordinator, who stepped into the reader role after some technical difficulties. Thank you all so much for coming together. Um, this is officially the end of our virtual performance, though you are welcome to stay for our optional Q&A session. After you get off the Zoom presentation, you will get a survey. I hope you will fill it out. Uh, this is our virtual production, so we would love your feedback on this pilot. Also, you can click on the two links located in the chat area on your Zoom border. One is a link that allows you to contribute. We offer this performance for free, but all the artists, designers, staff, women whose stories are read, all of them are paid for this presentation. Uh, and today, Modus will be splitting donations with the four women whose stories you heard. There is also a second link with actions you can take to support immigrants, get involved in the sanctuary movement, as well as how you can share a link to this performance or host your own reading of Women of Resolution in your home, church, or book club. Uh, so now we want to wave farewell to the legislators who courageously stepped into the shoes of the women and artists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for those attending this performance, if you want to stay with us, we now have an opportunity for a 15 to 20 minute Q&A session with sanctuary leaders Rosa Sabido, um, Ingrid represented by Katie, and then Katie Larson from the Sanctuary Coalition and Laura Peniche. Uh, you can use the Q&A tab on the Zoom screen, it should be at the bottom to type out your questions. There were so many of you, I think almost 200 of you listening, so clearly we will not get to um, all of the questions, but to cover as many questions as possible, MODIS staff, Undocumentologist Kiara Chavez, and Laura Penicia will be answering some questions via the text on the Q&A tab. So uh, as soon as y'all start putting in some questions, we can get started. Um, we'll start with this one. Uh, Rosa, Laura, and Katie, what actions do you recommend we take to support immigrants in our community? I will say get involved and get involved in uh, the different actions. Sometimes uh, there are some uh, call to action from different groups. There are always groups of uh, like immigrant coalitions and all over the country now. And uh, just, uh, you know, raise your voice, help us to make this uh, change and uh, vote. Vote for uh, those uh, people who are caring for other people. And, um, just be proactive, you know, help the ones who, right, like right now at this moment of uh, 
uh, of uh, quarantine and, and, and this problem we are facing, uh, there are a lot of um, immigrant communities and people who are not um, receiving the benefits of uh, the government and they're losing their jobs. They struggle to bring uh, food to their, you know, their families um, to, 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 to be able to pay for the basic needs. So there is a lot to do. And I'm, I'm sure each one of you know uh, at least one immigrant or, or are close to one. So that's, that's where I will recommend. Thank you. Um, I can share on behalf of Ingrid, um, definitely some actions like Rosa was saying, um, financial support is always 100% needed, especially in this time. So if um, I I'm, was told, I'm pretty sure, so that Ingrid's GoFundMe page will be going out. Um, I'm pretty sure all of the women living in sanctuary have GoFundMe pages. So even just giving whatever you can to that is really helpful. And then Ingrid has launched a campaign called No Mas Chuecos. Um, if you don't speak Spanish, I know that can be a challenging word for you, but a link for that will go out as well. And um, there's a Facebook page, an Instagram page, and a website. So that shares different information about how to educate the undocumented community about what are the consequences of using false documents. Um, as well as trying to educate the broader community about um, why things like a black market for false documents exists and how we can really de destigmatize immigration. So definitely check those out, follow them, share them. That's those are some main steps for Ingrid. I would suggest uh, getting involved with the women in sanctuary themselves. Uh, there is. It's a lot of work to do uh, with their own personal campaigns, and they need a lot of support. Um, and don't forget to visit them once in a while if you can, because they are amazing people that you want to be friends with. I would also really recommend that, um, that you join the Colorado Rapid Response Network which is a network in Colorado to respond to raids um, or to detentions by ICE. This work is very important because it is um, a form of deportation defense that we have right now. And we are also able to, to document injustices that are happening to our immigrant communities. So um, that's just one of the many um, my, one of the many efforts in Colorado, but you know, there is um, all the links that we are sharing. There are, I think, they're a really great place to start. Uh, but also, don't forget that right now during this pandemic, there are immigrants in detention, and they are not safe right now from the virus. Um, mo I know from my work and my experience, um, many of these immigrants who are in this detention center, they're there just because they got picked up on their way to work or on, even on their way to drop off their kids to school or just because they showed up to, to go to court for something, a civil matter. And when they end up getting in immigrant detention with ICE, um, it's, it's, it's pretty unfair, uh, but now that they're at risk and they, they really, they're really afraid that they're never going to be able to come out of that detention center and see their families again. I think it's really important for all of us as Coloradans to advocate for them because they can't really do it for themselves from inside. Um, so that's just you know, one, one of the many, many other things that we can do here in Colorado to help our immigrant families. Thank you all for sharing some actions and you'll see in the chat that there's already links in there that people can start clicking through. Um, uh, for the next question, Katie, can you share how does sanctuary work? 
how do I get my church involved in the sanctuary movement? Yeah, um, so there's a couple different ways. Um, if you are looking to be a host congregation, you can contact, um, I'll put my email in the chat in just a second. So you can contact myself directly. Um, Ingrid and I do the kind of the Boulder County Sanctuary Coalition in that area, or um, as well as contacting Janet Vizguera. You can definitely check her out on social media. Um, and there's definitely st just basic steps that a church has to go through. Um, as well as the person that's entering into sanctuary. Um, but really, like, there are, like a lot of us are saying, um, that's kind of a big step, I think, sometimes for a congregation to take. And so when I was speaking with Jenna and Ingrid about this, um, really some of the, the biggest things to recognize if you're looking to get involved in the sanctuary movement as a faith community is to really understand that it's not going to be an act of charity or pity, that it's really about understanding that you're wanting to, you're motivated to protect these people and that these people are warriors and making a sacrifice and a fight to protect one of the most precious gifts that we have, which is our families. Thank you. Um, Rosa, is there a pathway to citizenship? Well, um uh not not really it is very hard to to uh obtain a legal status uh you must have a lot of money and to be able to you know be granted uh residency or citizenship automatically but uh also it depends on what country are you coming from and uh, it's very hard at this moment to anyone to just uh, go and uh, fill out an application and be uh, granted legal status. It's just um, almost impossible. It's not like uh, just a matter of filling out papers. It's a long process. As you can see, I've been, I've been trying to become a permanent resident for 32 years now. It's going to be 33 pretty soon, and and I'm still not don't have an answer. And um, and uh, the same with many other people. Uh, even though we you know we have relatives who are uh, uh, citizens, uh, naturalized citizens of this country, um, it takes a long time, and 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 it's getting harder and harder so yes and my sim seems to be easy because somebody heard somebody else that had their documents in nine months or two years we have to see a lot of factors and 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 um first of all what what country are they coming from because we're not treated the same from uh you know, Mexico and Central and South America, that uh, is people that, that are coming from Europe or, you know, uh, Canada. So, uh, yes, it, it is almost impossible. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you. Um, I can take this next question. It says, shouldn't we be concerned with citizens right now? Um, and I think you know, COVID-19 really has shown us how interwoven we all are. And just as we are caring for our neighbors and our friends and our families in this time of crisis, it's, it's caring for women and sanctuary just makes the whole world a better place. It really is just about extending that, that empathy towards each other. And um, yeah, I mean, this, uh, of any time, this is the time when we're all realizing how connected we all really are. Um, I saw some questions in the Q&A about access to the recording, access to some links, access to uh, Dominique's poem, and everything will be accessible in the follow-up emails, so look out for that. Um, I don't see any other questions right now, so perhaps we can stop here. Um, 
uh, on behalf of Modus Theater, thank you so much again for the courageous women in sanctuary whose stories we have heard today, the artists, the legislators, and of course, all of the attendees for joining us. Please take good care of yourselves. We look forward to seeing you at our next performance. And of course, thank you for your support and for sharing once you get your follow-up email. Thank you, y'all.